Yeah, hi, I'm Ryan from Coffee Beans Delivered, and we're here with Gautam today, and he's going to talk through uh, some of this lovely information about the washing stations in Rwanda, and and we've got some of the coffee coming in for that as well. So yeah, introduce yourself, Gautam. Hey guys, my name is Gautam and Daligan, and I'm a co-owner of Moraho Trading Company based in Rwanda with my brother Karthik. I um, have been in the coffee industry for eight years now and uh, started this company with my brother six years ago. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking more about Rwanda and what we do there um, and the coffees you guys will be drinking soon through Re Ride. Yeah, so I guess the uh, first thing we need to do is get the elephant out of the room. A lot of people, when they think of Rwanda, remember the horrific events, 1994 genocide. Um, but I want to focus on the positive aspect about that and what coffee has contributed to rebuilding and strengthening the country in the industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as you're right, like when people think of Rwanda, the first thing they think about is um, the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Um, but I'm glad you've asked for the positive sides of um, how the country has grown and where it's come from. And I think Rwanda, the best way to describe um, our nation is it is the perfect way it's given hope to the rest of the world is the best way to describe it. And uh, 25 years and what the country has achieved has just been phenomenal through the leadership of our president and government. Um, and coffee has played a huge part. You know, if coffee was introduced in the 1930s by the Belgians um, when they came over and they were forced, um, they forced Rwandan farmers to, to plant trees. But the only issue um, is that this kind of made a funnel effect and um, they didn't really give much resources or anything they were just told to plant trees which had a huge um, flow on effect of quality and uh, also of low prices paid to farmers it was only until um, 15 years ago when specialty coffee and the government started to focus on specialty coffee and pushing rwanda coffee into from commercial to specialty that we've really seen um, rwanda coffee um, escalate into some of the top coffees in the world and nowadays when people talk about Rwanda coffee it's mainly focused on specialty coffee yeah. and not to do with um, commercial stuff coffee uh, commercial grade coffees um, and of course this has benefited the country coffee is by far the biggest export in the nation um, or over 350,000 farmers um, uh, rely on coffee as their main income and uh, specialty coffee doesn't rely as much with the C price market so you know it's always kind of guarantees a good price and a fair price and it's more at least risk to marginalize our farmers through specialty coffee than commercial coffees where you know what happens in brazil essentially dictates the entire coffee chain which just doesn't make sense yeah and it's so good to see that that change that shift from just any sort of coffee doesn't matter what it is just produce, produce, produce to now there's better processes, better methods, and uh, essentially you're getting much better quality coffee. And, Absolutely. and yeah, I always think about how great the coffee is coming out of Rwanda, mm. especially for its size as well. Like the size of the country, the amount of coffee that's produced from there is amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, tell us a bit about, um, I guess, Rwanda's future place in coffee like what do, what do you see in the trends now and the landscaping that's happening with the future especially coffee in Rwanda yeah so Rwanda uh, our aim as a country and also our government um, governing board are, are trying to push Rwanda to become 100% specialty coffee so the aim what I see for Rwanda in the future is we will I already think we have closed the gap because, you know, when people think of African coffees, the first thing that comes to mind, let's be honest, is either Kenyan or Ethiopian coffees. And I think, you know, bridging that gap was always one of our main focuses mm. for quality wise. And I think already we're getting up there and, um, and in the future, I think we'll be on par or if not better, true, but I mean, yeah. I might be a bit biased, but this is just, you know, what I think so. Um, yeah. I know that for people who know coffee a lot, um, one of the key factors that kind of put behind uh, Rwanda a little bit behind in quality was the potato defect. I'm not, I'm sure you're all well aware about Rwanda and Burundi and Congo are the only three countries yeah. that tend to get this defect. 
But if you look at the percentage and the amount of effort that's gone into the coffee washing station levels and the government and the processing and the education on coffee and how to bring up a tree, it has bring, it's brought down this defect drastically. And I think um, we will continue to fight to almost eliminate this defect. Um, yeah, okay. And uh, another thing I think is also Rwanda is in the process of planting a lot of new coffee seedlings because a lot of our coffee trees are quite old and they're almost on average 20 to 25 years old. Um, so we are actually seeing a decline in the amount of coffee cherries produced every year. And on top of that, climate change. Yeah. But the focus has to shift on battling climate change and also planting more um, new coffee trees to bring back the quality, uh, not the quality, the quantity of the cherries back up. Yeah. Um, and the biggest challenge of all is trying to convince youth to get into coffee. Yeah. Um, which is really obviously is, um, one of the factors that Rwanda is really focusing on. And in 10 years time, I feel um, if we don't get that right now, it's going to be a, a big challenge if, if that happens, but I don't think it will. Yeah, that's definitely right. Like there will be a shortfall as well mm -hmm. because the world's drinking more and more coffee every day. And mm -hmm. if the youths aren't getting involved with it and taking over the family business, then yeah, there's just going to be this more bigger shortfall. So Absolutely. that brings me to the next question about, um, you know, what does it look like for a day in the life of a farmer? You know, what is the, you know, tell us a bit about what a coffee farmer would do on a daily basis then and, Obviously, you're seeing it at from the washing station side of things, yeah. and you're dealing with these people daily. Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, of course, I deal with it from the washing side, uh, washing station side. But we do have um, um, a lot of communication, and we visit our farmers on a daily basis um, because, as I said, you know, Rwanda, unlike other countries in the world, for example, like Brazil, a coffee farmer has thousands and thousands and thousands of trees and acres and acres of land whereas in Rwanda we work with small holder farmers whereby some farmers might have we have farmers that only have two trees and that's considered one farmer and we work with farmers with 100 trees with you know 10 trees and in total last year we actually worked um, last harvest we worked with 5,828 farmers in total wow. as our company. So what I'm trying to just paint a picture of how many farmers we deal with individual yeah. farmers. And we treat them all equally. Um, so a daily life in a farmer is, of course, you know, they also have other crops such as beans and maize that they have to um, grow because it's easy to grow as well. And it's one of those things with um, the difference between those crops is you can harvest them every year and quicker and sell them to the local market. But the issue is you get very low prices for it. A coffee is quite an attractive um, a crop. Um, it's an attractive crop because it gets higher price per kg. Yeah. But the only the only issue with that is for some farmers, you know, when you plant new coffee seedlings, it takes three years of intensive care until you get your first picks, your returns. Yeah. So you know we kind of have to balance with our farmers to. Um, for the ones that don't realize why should I put so much effort into bringing up this crop that only gives me rewards in three years time. And for that matter, once it really matures five years time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's something that farmers uh, on a daily basis is a daily, not a struggle, but a daily constant uh, push we're trying to have with them to try and educate them with our help, how much more beneficial it's going to be. Yeah. Um, and from when we started six years ago to now we've seen massive, massive, um, benefits on giving seedlings and uh, what they've achieved and they can see it themselves yeah it's great that you're able to like educate them and help them like you know see a future in coffee i think that's admirable that you're not just there you know getting them to bring all the coffees to you so you can um process them but you're actually there giving back and you know giving them education and giving them helpful hints to get better processes in place and, and build a better future for their families. And that that's really admirable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's go and talk about um, you guys in Marajo. Um, so how did you guys start out and you've been running six years now and tell us a bit about the history of your uh, business. Yeah. So um, a lot of you might be thinking why I'm not Rwandan or why do I sound, you know, as if I'm from New Zealand. Um, so 
I was fortunate enough uh, when I was young, my parents, um, when I was 11 and my brother was 12, uh, sent us over here for a better life because of how Rwanda was back in the day. Um, so we got sent here for education and mum and dad always stayed back in Rwanda. So um, we, I developed my passion for coffee when I was in New Zealand. And especially in the, my university days, I started to really explore coffee and go to cafes and really, you know, try, you know, as you were saying, not just drink a flat white for the sake of drinking a flat white or a you know long black or what whatever you order, but actually trying to process what goes behind the scenes from um, um, behind coffee. And coming from a coffee producing country, you know, I knew the basics of it, but not really the ins and outs. Um, but then one thing I noticed when I was in New Zealand, and for that matter, when I traveled to Australia and wherever I went, I just never saw um, Rwanda Burundi coffees. I mm. always saw Kenyan or an Ethiopian. Yeah, which just uh, shocked me and I just didn't understand why because I knew about our country and our uh, environment and how perfect it is to um, grow good specialty coffee and the potential it has and the potential that the untouched potential till today there's so much more we can do um, so long story short I my brother was working as a logistics uh, manager for companies all across East Africa and Uganda Kenya and Rwanda so he had that side of uh, knowledge already because um, from the export side and I just decided I knew I always wanted to work for myself and I always wanted to kind of connect New Zealand and Rwanda together, my two homes, I call it together. And from that is where the kind of whole process started. And I kid you not, in August 2015, I called my brother one day. I said, look, I'm going to put my savings and try buy a piece of land and try and make a difference to the community and the country that's given us so much. Um, and my brother at the time was like, you know, this is a huge risk and all that, but he managed to uh, join me in December and then we registered the company in December 2015. January bought two pieces of land in the southwest of Rwanda and just started building two stations. And here we are six years on with six stations and uh, 5,000 farmers we work with and exporting some of the best coffees from Rwanda worldwide. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. What a yeah. great story. Yeah. No, and that you had that you were fortunate enough to be able to do that you know that you didn't just turn your back on your hometown and you've actually gone no I want to put money back in and I've got the opportunity you know being in New Zealand and having the um the, I guess where you were at and then being able to go no I want to put money back into the country and help build it that's fantastic and yeah thank you man. highly thank admirable you. thank you um so what have been the biggest hurdles that you've had to overcome in doing this business, starting this business? Well, <laughs> the biggest hurdles, man, where do I begin? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, it's, yeah, I'm trying to think what, oh, there's so many. Um, look, when we started this company, we were um, also, you know, quite inexperienced compared to what we were now. So, we were the first company, okay, one of the biggest hurdles, let's say, was um, when we started the company five years, uh, six years ago, we were only, Rwanda still didn't really process honeys and natural, natural coffees, for example. So, and there was, it was not allowed in actual fact to be processed and exported legally. Um, right. So we were the first company to um, have, go into conversation with NAIB, which is our governing body, um, the agricultural governing body of Rwanda, and we had to convince them that if Rwanda doesn't start processing natural and honey coffees, we were going to fall back in the specialty um, uh, coffee world. And they wouldn't understand, but because I can also understand their point of view, it's like, how can you produce naturals and honey without much experience as a country? And we've come so far from that whole commercial, you know, when people thought Rwanda yeah. was crap quality coffee. To, so if we started to produce naturals and honeys and sending it to um, our clients worldwide, and our quality was rubbish, that's going to look so bad on Rwanda's reputation. So, but we did somehow have meeting after meeting after meeting, and we finally convinced them. And they said, look, you're the only company this year that we're going to, that's going to be able, allowed to do it. They essentially used us as a tester after all the nagging we did, really. Um, and then, uh, so there was a hell of a lot of pressure on Muraho to produce and successfully sell honeys and natural coffees at a premium price. And we were the first company to legally do it. And now it's set up the, um, and we successfully did it. 
um, through some help from our partners in Colombia Raw Materials, um, Miguel, a guy in Colombia who helped us with kind of the idea of how to process natural and honeys. What, but what works in Colombia is different to Rwanda, but we kind of, you know, talked it out and, you know, geeked out on how to process it. And um, yeah, and here we are now and it's opened uh, the honey and natural markets for Rwanda and other producers are now allowed to produce it legally without having um, any issues. That's brilliant. That That's truly an amazing story. Like I did not know that about Rwanda at all, that it was illegal yeah, to yeah, yeah. process honey and natural processed coffees. That's yeah, and then you've managed to shape the land completely around. And yeah, you really have then brought Rwanda into the modern, uh, like specialty coffee age where these naturals and the different um, honey washed uh, states of processing are really sought after now, like especially Ethiopians. They're like everywhere you get, they're all different types of uh, honey process, whether it be black or red. and. And so then, yeah, you've brought Rwanda right up there, which is fantastic. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> that's a good notch on your belt. That's brilliant. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so what? Tell me, what does "hobe hobe hobe" mean? We we've been trying to find we're trying to find what it actually means, and we can't find a translation. But no, so "hobe hobe hobe" it, it almost it kind of. One of the, you know, these, some of these words in certain um, languages that you can't really just exactly translate it um, right. to English, but essentially what it means is like we are all together. Like Horbe, 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 how do I describe it? Is we are, we're a family run company. So, you know, we, we um, don't refer to any of our, um, well, it's run by me and my brother. Um, and we grew up with very strong family values and togetherness. It just runs through what we are and who we are and what we represent. Um, so we don't call, for example, our employees, um, you know, employees or staff or whatever. We just call ourselves the Maraha family. We're like brothers and sisters. So we have this whole family vibe when it comes to our company. And Horbe, Horbe, Horbe is something in Rwanda. When you don't see someone for a long time or someone so close to you is about to leave, you almost kind of say, like, you know, it's a, it's a way of greeting someone. It's someone welcoming you into your family. So if someone in Rwanda says, Hobe, hobe, hobe to you. It's one of the most like most uh, most privileged and best ways someone can welcome you and accept you into our family sort of thing. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, that's great. I love, yeah, if we were trying to find the translations and we, we couldn't, couldn't, but that's perfect. That's I really love that translation there. Now, so yeah, let's have a look at them. Yeah, and you're running you're running barista competitions. At the washing station as well? No, no, we're not running barista competitions. Like that was no. I think um, we have people who have represented our coffees in the barista competitions. Worldwide. Right. Not at the stations. No, no. Okay, no. I, I misunderstood. Like I thought you held them at <laughs> no, the no, station. No. That was. <laughs> oh, that could be something for the future. Like it has been <laughs> our dream to get eventually. You know, you have to go take it in progress, but to get some of our producers and farmers to actually make coffees and learn how to make, you know, flat whites and stuff. That would be the ultimate dream, but we'll get there slowly. Yeah. Yeah. That would be certainly something amazing, amazing to have. Yeah. Um, we haven't talked about what we're drinking, which is Nyamasheki. Is that how, I, did I pronounce it right? Nyamasheki? Yeah, Nyamasheki. 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 <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're drinking Nyamasheki coffee and that's from three different regions. Nyamasheke is the southwest region of Rwanda, but it comes from three, it's a blend of three of our coffee washing stations. So it's a blend of Kilimbi, Rugali, and um, Gisheke. Yeah. Our three stations, yeah. And how many um, farmers bring in coffees to that area? How many farmers bring it in? Yeah, so for Rugali, it was 1,184 1, farmers in Rugali, and Kisheke was around 777 farmers. Wow. And if I remember right, Kalimbi was 1,078 farmers. So if you add that yeah. up, what's that come to? Around 3,000? Yeah, you, you'll have to add it up. A lot of farmers. <laughs> That's but, great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, you know, talking about the smallholder farmers, you might find this interesting is um, – out of those farmers, almost 50% of um, those farmers bring coffees to us um, less than 50 kgs in the whole season. And that's right. their income. Yeah. So this is what I'm trying to say about that very small holder farmers we work with. 
and we are trying to push new seedlings in order to bring up the yield so yeah. we can have on average more farmers bringing we want to bring that for, you know that percentage down you know we don't want that many farmers only bringing 50 kgs of cheese yeah and it's too, you know. that's how many harvests are they doing a year two or just one well one harvest in rwanda we only have one harvest yet so that's it and 50 kgs of cherry um, yeah doesn't even give you it gives you like you know if you talk about exportable green it gives you honestly like 15 kgs not even of wow. green, which is nothing <laughs> yeah, yeah that yeah that no wonder yet yeah. and so they're really only sitting on very small blocks of land and yeah. they've somehow got to get the um the yield up on that same block of land, which is tough. Yeah. Yeah, it is tough, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, at Gasheki, there's a... Liam found that you have swimming cows there, <laughs> and uh, you can only um, access that place by a boat. By a boat, that's right. So, yeah, tell us about Gasheki then. That sounds like an amazing place to go. <laughs> Yeah, Gesheke is uh, is a, yeah, it's a spe it's a special station. Like it was um, one of the um, so we started as I said with uh, Rogali and Kalimbi in our first year, and then we brought on Vonga Cooperative and uh, and Shira, which is our stations up north, and a cooperative we partnered up north, and then we partnered with a place called Bumbogo in Gakenke district, and then Gesheke was our newest of the stations, which we started in 2017. Um, this station is near Kilembi, but there is no road access to the station, um, and it's you have to take your a boat through Lake Kivu, and you can see Congo on the other side and Edgewe Island, which is a famous island. Um, and you do it's known for you get you see a lot of native birds, but the main main thing it's really famous for is yeah if you're lucky you get to see farmers that take their um, uh, cows from one side of. Uh, of the land to uh, some of these smaller islands where there's good fresh um, grass for them that they believe is quite special to eat and watching cows swim is uh yeah it's <laughs> i don't know how to explain it you can only imagine how weird that looks but they, yeah. swim. they swim very well yeah. in deep waters <laughs> i mean that is incredible i've never heard about <laughs> swimming cows before but it, maybe they yeah if they're uh, trained enough then they're gonna enjoy it I think all the cows here would just drown. <laughs> <laughs> but they seem, I kid you not, like, yeah, I, I mean, I've seen it obviously multiple times, but it always yeah. shocks me. They look as if they're swimming as if we're swimming. They're just so calm and off they go, have their food, and then come back. That's it. Just follow the farmer in his boat. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're just doggy paddling? Are they just... Doggy paddling, that's exactly yeah. the best way to describe it. Wow. You know? Yeah, no, no wonder you wanted to get to that place. That would have been amazing <laughs> experience just the first time traveling out to there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So how do you um, how do you go against competing with those uh, larger scale companies as well? And I, I think Sukafina are in there as well. Yeah, Sukafina so have a very strong. I mean, they are they have their equivalent of their producing. They have a company they call Ruakoff. Yeah, Ruakoff. Yeah. Yeah, which um, almost does, I think, 40% 40, 40 of Rwanda's coffee. But yeah, something like that. They are the biggest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, we, you know, end of the day, we need the big companies because they buy the volume. So, you know, volume has to move end of the day. But at the same time, we do need them to also bring down, I mean, they have to play a part and not margin. I'm not saying they're marginalizing. I'm talking as a general speaking, like we need the big players to also play a part in making sure that farmers are not marginalized. Yeah. Um, so specialty coffee, as I said, doesn't really uh, get affected much. And it's the beauty about specialty coffee is the price you pay to, um, we receive for our coffees at least guarantees our farmers that they're not going to be affected by what the um, C market price does. You know, I, I just find it unbelievable that, um, as I said, what it all essentially comes down to what happens in Brazil that dictates mm. the you know market price, and it's it's already these guys uh, farmers are you know they're not that wealthy, and then when you're trying to tell me that a C market price that they don't even know exists or whatever it dictates how much they get paid, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, and so that's why I believe that we need. I believe, and the Rwandan government is continuing to push um, so that we only 
produce, they want Rwanda to become 100% specialty focused. And we are getting more and more and more specialty focused, but there's still some uh, long way to go. Um, yeah. No, the thing, is, the thing is, there has to be a fixed price, at least, that the um, farmers get that doesn't marginalize them. And that's that's what we all stand, uh, stand for as a company and we continue to fight for. Yeah, that's great. I, I really hope it continues to keep pushing the price up and you can um, yeah, reward your farmers for their hard work by paying them more as well. And I think over time, you know, we're still looking at prices for, you know, bottles of wine um, and you should be paying, you know, per glass of wine, you should be almost paying that same price for coffee as well. Oh, um, exactly. And, you know, that's, you, you're right there, right? Um, a good thing is I, I, I never, you know, I always try to explain to my friends and, you know, people who say they love coffee and there, but then, you know, I find it fascinating in coffee. If we were to put you guys in the, as the, um, you know, roasters and cafes, if you were to put your price up by, you know, 50 cents a cup, you know, the, the havoc it causes and people yeah. say, oh, I'm not going to pay, you know, five bucks or whatever, you know, for a cup of coffee. It just, but yet for a glass, I mean, a glass of wine, a bottle of wine, people are willing to pay, you know, a hundred bucks, 80 bucks, yeah. whatever it may be, which just doesn't make sense. You know, people, yeah. You know, I, but this is where I'm saying the education has to be, we, we still have to keep pushing um, in the specialty world to educate our clients. Um, and I don't blame them because they only know what they've been told. So, yeah, exactly. Um, it's only when you come to coffee producing countries that you realize the amount of hands and effort that goes into making that cup of coffee that you want. You know, yeah. So, oh my goodness, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I like the amount of hands that, coffee has to go through it's crazy uh, yeah compared to wine as well and it's yeah it's more complex a drink than wine is it really is <laughs> so it'll take time just more of this information being available to the public i think people will understand that yeah actually what goes into your cup of coffee is huge amount of effort right back from the start right to the moment you get it so yeah, it's certainly people like yourself helping at that end and, you know, bringing this education through right through to us at the roasting end. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, working together and just educating the consumers about this is how we give the farmers more money and better, um, pr better futures. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, your statement on your uh, business is two brothers... Yeah. One dream, land of a thousand hills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, look, two brothers, it's just, you know, obviously me and my brother. And the dream is to give back to the country that has given us so much. Um, and that's done through specialty coffee. And, of course, Rwanda is referred to as the land of a thousand hills. Well, it literally is the yeah. land of a thousand hills. <laughs> you can't escape rolling hills there. Um, so, um, look, this is a company that's, I mean, it's, it's very it strikes both me and my brother in the heart. It means a lot to us. And you know? I so, as I said, we were very fortunate that my parents were, uh, could send us to New Zealand. Um, um, you know, a lot of my friends didn't get that chance. So we are very lucky. So I've seen both sides and I, that's why I find me and my brother were in a unique place where I've been the consumer here in New Zealand and I've seen it. Um, I've seen the other side as well from the farmers. And um, this company is based to bridge that gap. And we will continue to bridge that gap and we will continue to do what we can to educate clients, partners, and also the most important thing is give back to our farmers that deserve it the most. And we have had farmers that we've worked at since the day one to um, now six years on, we've still had that same group. Our people, our partners who have visited us every single year, they are astonished that we have the exact same employees. And that's why we talk about this family atmosphere. Um, Hopefully you can come visit us once as well. Yeah. That would be great. And I'm sure I almost confidently say um, if the company, you know, nothing happens, you know, you never know. But but in 10 years' time, you will see the exact same people. Um, so, yeah, this is what we try to, to um, I guess, develop or uh, not develop is not the right word to, what's the word I'm looking for? Try to achieve is what we're trying to do is this whole, we just keep going with that whole family basis and family yeah. motto that we have. Yeah. 
yeah, uh, I'd love to be able to go there in the future when we can travel safely. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely was yeah, yeah. what I was setting up to do just before COVID hit. So now uh, the mission is as soon as we can get back to travel, I'm going to come and do a lot of uh, origin yeah, trips. Yeah. I'd love to yeah, visit uh, yeah. Nyamashek and, and yeah, see, more yeah, more see what's going on there. See if we can see some swimming cows even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we're looking forward to offering your coffee uh, to our customers uh, next month. We're going to run it for the whole month and then hopefully we can even establish a relationship where we get it ongoing and we can offer this to our customers all year round. Um, thank you so, so yeah, that would be a great pleasure. So thank you very much and uh, all the best. And thank you so uh, much. All the we'll, best to you as well. Yeah, we'll speak to you soon. Ciao. Bye -bye. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you, mate. Cheers.